After a kind of traumatic experience uh, making my first Hollywood picture, I sort of went back and started to rethink what I was doing and uh, came up with this idea, you know, based on this photograph in Life magazine, and then tried to construct a, a story that worked for it. two Siamese uh, sisters that were attached at the hip. It was a very disturbing uh, picture because uh, they were reaching adolescence and one seemed to be very happy and gay and the other one was sort of hunched over and looked very strange. The caption on the photograph was, though Masha and Dasha are uh, physically normal as they approach adolescence, they're developing some psychological problems. So I said, wow, they look like they have a few psychological problems. In this, I am in agreement with my colleagues. Although they tend to think that Dominique is the truly disturbed one, I think they will find that Daniel, who is so sweet, so responsive, so normal, as opposed to her sister, can only be so because of her sister. I was like uh, hopelessly unemployable. I had had this idea of sisters and Phantom of the Paradise, which I had written under contract to um, Filmways, who uh, financed Hi Mom and bought Greetings. And I managed to buy them back because I knew they weren't going to make them. I couldn't convince the producer. I remember we had a big fight over well, nobody will believe you can put anybody in a convertible couch. And I said, I've done it. It works. Brian called because he had this falling out with Ray Stark, the producer, on uh, these two projects and asked if we would try to get them away from Ray so we could do them with him. And so uh, that was the start of a process which uh, got us involved. We'd been friendly with Brian, but now we were talking about working together uh, on both projects. The movie business is, you know, luck, meeting the right people at the right time. I had known Ed because he was in New York and uh, he's working with another director, Paul Williams, and we were part of a kind of a New York you know, sort of underground film group and we had met a couple of times. And Ed liked the, the sister's script and by some miracle, managed to raise the money to do it. My father had died, but my mom ran the toy company, and she totally supported my effort to become a producer. And so the toy company's willingness to give me the credit backing so they, that we were able to get the lab, the equipment, the sound, and all that um, on credit. I had gone to California, you know, sort of in hopeless despair because everything I was doing in New York wasn't working and uh, ran into Jennifer and stayed at her house and that's where I met Margot and I that's where I got the idea of using them and writing the script with them in mind. Jennifer Salt was living there and, and Brian I think was dating Margot and she was living there and other uh, people around, Paul Schrader, and a lot of people. And uh, so the idea of doing Sisters first was the most practical idea. It was, seemed, the idea Brian had was to work with Margot and Jennifer and uh, people that were part of the family. And that's the famous Trancas house that you read about and in the, in the uh, meeting place of all the 70s filmmakers, that was Jennifer Saltz and Margot's house, and everybody used to come there on the weekends. Uh, that's where Sisters was basically created. I'd worked with Jennifer as an actress before. Margot was sort of emerging as a, you know, a young uh, movie star in Hollywood Hello? at that time. Hello? I said, this is perfect. Hi. And I, I remember going to the house, I remember the 
meeting them, it was December 9th, I remember the day, because, uh, and I stayed at that house until I came back to New York and we started to uh, go into pre-production for the movie. He definitely wrote the two sisters for Margo and Jennifer, and I think they also helped on the script to some degree, uh, shaping it, because it, it was Jennifer's very much the way she is in the movie. It's very Jennifer, very push, go, keep going, you know, shove, shove, get, get there, ask the questions, no nonsense. And Margo, he had just met, had a romance within uh, Malibu. She'd only done Canadian films and lots of TV. She was like the most working actor I've ever met, but she was just insecure. She'd never done, she always did the romantic, happy girl. And this was like playing Miss Psycho. She'd never done that. As the picture went on and on, she sort of became crazier and crazier, is the, is the best way I can put it. The part, as you, as you can see, touches on everything a woman feels. I mean, it's maternal, it's a love story at the beginning for half an hour. It's the maternal feeling of losing a baby. It's uh, watching your sister get killed by your husband. <laughs> I mean, this is all traumatic stuff. And she was internalizing it, and as the film went on, she really got more and more disturbed. She'd be crying in the corner, you know, going to Brian to get held and patted. The nude scene was a nightmare for her. I mean, it was like they had to clear the set several times. She didn't want anybody around. Everything was, it was not a happy thing for her to do, but it came out incredible. I mean, her performance is incredible. The way she looks when she goes is, is wonderful. When she goes nuts, it's like that whole, lip and the, the eyes going, you know, God knows where they go, but they, they're not focused on anything. Bill was in my first uh, short, uh, or rather my third short, uh, Botan's Wake. He played Botan. I, you know, he was a big character actor in college. Uh, and then he went off and, you know, worked with this uh, environmental theater group for three or four years. And he was Dionysus and Dionysus in 69. A very original, completely eccentric character. And I would always try to create material for him. I mean, he's kind of unique. Bill scared me in those days because you know, he was very, very strange, but he was, he was wonderful also. The whole cast was just great, I thought. And uh, I never forgave him for leaving me up on the telephone pole. He was a wannabe. He wanted to be a, a private detective, and he read the book. But he was inept, he didn't really know what he was doing, and, and which made it funny. Well, it was a joke on him, because I, I would be coming around in this car, I had to kind of go around, and I said to Brian, how was that? He said, do it again. Then I said, what do you want? Tell me what you want. And he said, just do it again. And he told me to do it again on like the fourth or fifth take, and I said, you don't know what you want, do you? We put, but if you see it, you'll decide, tell me what's... <laughs> so after about 150 takes, he finally said yes. There was almost no improvisation. The only thing that was sort of, we would toss things in, like what the guy should look like, what Breton should look like. Um, he wanted basically Breton to be a red herring. Well, to me, what a red herring is, is someone who looks like he's the worst son of a bitch you've ever seen. So you immediately think, he probably did it. So with that in mind, we came up with a hunchback, the bruise, this ridiculous mustache, actually based on Breton, the surrealist. The accent was coached by Margot and Paul Hirsch. Uh, Paul speaks fluent French and Margot is from Canada, so they would work on lines with me. So I could sound more French, more, more French Canadian than Margot. <laughs> it was all a ridiculous mistake. There was nobody. Repeat. It was all a ridiculous mistake. There was nobody. There was nobody. Because there was no murder. I you know I just had some pretty grotesque images which I, you know, carried off and things that made perfect sense to me, but, you know, were probably very upsetting to the audience. 
in terms of uh, some of the things that happened in some of the, the murder scenes. First, the idea of stabbing him in the crotch, number one. Well, you know, this is the sister, jealous of the other sister, so where else is she going to attack him? And then to shut him up, she stabs him in the mouth. That made perfect sense to me, but, you know, it's pretty hard to watch. There was a problem with the, I wanted there to be a spot of blood on the back of the couch, but for, in order to make the camera move right, it was, I don't know what I did with that. It was too high, because the blood obviously would be where he is, which is basically where the cushions, he's, you know, you know he's wrapped in the mattress as it's folded over. So the camera was supposed to be able to dolly down to see that the blood was seeping through the base of the couch, but I think we could only get it so low, so we had to stick it up higher, which didn't quite work. I figured some way to make it work somehow, which is normally what any director does. You know, what have you got? What can they do? And figure out a way to make it work. These are films being made not for 600000 but being made for a million to two million dollars, which look like real movies, and it can be done. It's, it's really an attitude, and it, it's often easy to do it that way with a with a first-time filmmaker or a, a director who's you know so passionate that you know uh, he's willing to to go through the ordeal of of making a film with with uh, without the, the you know the resources and the comfort that that uh, a good budget brings but the, the, the quality of the film can actually be benefited. We're shooting with a non-union, you started with a non-union crew and then we got picketed and then we had to go union. Uh, it was a very short schedule. I mean, uh, it, it was a miracle we got through it. Uh, so I did the best I could with what I had, and I, which gives, you know, you many ideas how to make stuff work, which is essentially inexpensive and in very effective. One scene that I actually particularly love, and it's a little story in itself, is the scene that, the scene that lasts nine minutes, which is the first and the, I think still the best split screen shot ever done. We shot a very serious version of it with not much cleaning and um, you know, getting it right in time so it would, would work with what, what he was going to shoot next, so it would work with the, the other side of the screen, time-wise. And then I said, that was good, but can we go back and sort of make it funny? So we went back, and instead of just two things, I'm taking a whole bunch of cleaning fluid out, we're pouring the cleaning fluid on the floor. It's a huge mess. I'm sliding, I hit my head, you know, the, the bruise, the famous bruise. And it's just, it became like a, 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 a bit of a comedy in the, middle, in the middle of tension, which I think was a very good idea. And so did Brian, he, that's the version he used. He, you know, he realized that putting a little humor while the cops are coming, will they make it in time? Will they get the body in the couch? Will they clean up the blood? And to make that funny was, I think, a very good idea, and, and it worked. The split screen uh, elements in Brian's films are very much Brian. He is a big believer in split screen. He was a, um, a firm believer in it. I personally um, have some reservations about it. I think that the split screens that we've had in our films, uh, Carrie, for instance, or Sisters, I think actually the split screen in Sisters is some of the most uh, interesting work that Brian ever did with split screen. Split screen is a kind of counterpuntal sort of way of working where you're dealing with two parallel ideas and you're juxtaposing them against each other. And it's very good for some type of storytelling and not so good for things like the trashing of the prom and carry because split screen doesn't really work well in action. It's more of a meditative technique. It, it makes you aware of the movie as opposed to creating an illusion of a time and place that you inhabit as well. It, it's more of a framing device that is interesting intellectually but um, destroys a little bit the illusion of 
of um, a world that you're, a virtual world that you're inhabiting for a time. You know, we have the famous Godard quote that, you know, film is truth 24 times a second. Well, quite to the contrary, I think it lies 24 times a second. And uh, you can manipulate images to say anything you want, which is why television is such a great propaganda tool. And I'm always interested in showing, it's a kind of a Brechtian approach where you make the audience aware of the form that they're watching and how the form, uh, you know, the medium is the message, the Marshall McLuhan idea, the form, in fact, is so much a part of what is being expressed at the same time. It's Peeping Tom, starring Ted Black. Sisters has a whole bunch of voyeuristic things in it. It starts off with this, you know, pseudo television show, Peeping Tom, where you put the studio audience in the eye of the voyeur. There's the mock documentary, which gives all the past history of the um, Siamese twins, the sort of completely manufactured, so-called real backstory. Oh, and there's even another form, the dream sequence, where you use all kinds of surrealistic imagery again to give this backstory that sort of has gotten into uh, Jennifer's subconscious, so she sort of dreams herself into the Wazell Institute. So there are all kinds of ways in film to get dramatic and important information across without sort of just sort of laying it on the audience. You use the different film forms to help with that process. Ed and I got all these carnival freaks from Florida, and they just arrived, including Eddie the Giant, who's in you know that famous photograph uh, with his parents, the Jewish Giant. That was very strange because we got to know them, especially the Giant. I mean, not all not all the freaks were nice. There was a triplets who were the, just the most amazing, nasty people I've ever met. Uh, you know, really, really thought they were above everything and really nasty is the best way I could put it. I mean, the girls were just terrified. I mean, you know, because they had never seen all these very strange looking people. A guy with half a face, one with flippers for hands. Uh, Eddie, who was, you know, like seven foot, I don't know, eight or something. This huge guy that had hands that were immense. And they were indeed freaked out as we were wheeling them around in their twin wheelchairs. <laughs> uh. <laughs> At a certain point in the production, Ed Pressman, who was our producer, needed to raise more funds. And he asked me to prepare a short uh, section of the film to show to prospective investors. The sequence we decided to show was the first murder sequence. If we were to show it to investors, I couldn't just show it silently. So I thought, I have to have music for this sequence to really work. I was looking at Psycho for the first time with this awareness of how scenes are constructed and how many angles go into covering a scene and so forth, stuff that I'd really not thought too much about. And I was looking at this scene in Psycho where Janet Lee is being followed by a policeman. And I realized that the entire scene consisted of three angles. One was a close-up of her face. The other was a point of view of the road ahead of her. And the other angle was a point of view of the police car in the rear view mirror. And the scene had tremendous tension. And I thought, where is this tension coming from? And I realized it was the music. And I reached over and I turned off the sound on the television. And all I saw was this flat, sort of not very interesting images visually. Shot of the road, shot of the mirror, shot of the actress. When I turned the music back on, I, thought, I felt the hair on my neck stand up on end. And I thought, this is it. We've got to use this kind of music. Well, I was uh, in the editing room, and Paul Hirsch uh, and I were putting uh, 
various musical pieces against the cut sequences, and of course we were using a lot of Psycho and Vertigo and a lot of Herman's music. And we sort of looked at each other and said, uh, why don't we get this guy to do it? I mean, this, this is great. And he said to Ed Pressman, why don't we get Bernard Herrmann to do our film? Where is he? Is he still alive? They didn't even know if he was alive. I met Benny coming up the elevator in a movie lab, and, uh, and he had been on a long flight, and he's a kind of a gruff, doesn't really make eye contact. He has this, you know, cane, and he's looking down. And, and, you know, we're trying to be, Mr. Herman, it's so great to have you here. And he couldn't care less what we thought, and let's get on with it. And then we brought him into the screening room, and uh, we started the movie, and I had all this temp track in of his music, which I thought was flattering. We start the screening, and the first note comes on, and Benny lets out a scream, no music, take that out. I don't want to hear any music. You know, we've upset this great master, and I run back and rip the temp track off, uh, and uh, we play it for him silent. And But it, it was a extremely upsetting uh, morning. Eventually, he consented to do the film. He went back to London and recorded the score while I was working day and night, seven days a week, trying to get the film ready in time. And finally, we get to the mix and we get to the murder scene. The film is running and all of a sudden we're past the moment and there's no music. So Benny, without turning around, yelled out, where's the music? Isn't there music there, Paul? And the music mixer, who had forgotten to, who had just forgotten to open the pot, said, no, no, it's my fault. I, but all that Benny heard was no. And he turned, he jumped up and he turned at me and he said, how dare you say no? I recorded that music, I wrote it, I conducted it, I recorded it, you are insolent, how dare you speak to me that way? And he was in a rage and the veins were standing out on his forehead and his face was turning red and he was frothing in the mouth and all I could think of was, please don't die yelling at me. Once we got through the, the maelstrom, uh, you know, we basically became very close and uh, uh, he's a very emotional Benny. But he has this, this kind of wild side to him, and you don't know when the volcano is going to erupt. That first experience on Sisters it was just uh, terribly wounding. And I was, I was 26 years old at the time and uh, not really equipped for uh, a tongue lashing from, from a master like uh, Maestro Herman. Sisters was a big hit because nothing had been done since Psycho, even by Hitchcock, who was still alive, that was of any, that, that took Psycho anywhere else. So even though the logo of Sisters is, is Psycho, right, with the slash going across, the feeling of Sisters is entirely different, and the, the number of new ideas that's in Sisters that are not in any Hitchcock movie ever are incredible. If anything, there's more from Polanski in Sisters than than uh, Hitchcock. At first, Brian was criticized for, for being too influenced by Hitchcock. Uh, but in fact, Hitch had landed on a notion that was very important to Brian, which is the idea of point of view. And he felt that the best way to engage the audience is to have them see the, view the action through one of the character's eyes. Well, I'm compared to Hitchcock all the time, mostly by people that don't quite understand me or Hitchcock. I understand Hitchcock extremely well. I mean, uh, you know, I've been behind those eyeballs. I see the way those shots are constructed. And many of the comparisons made by me are ludicrous. I mean, you know, I, you, know you read them all the time. You don't know what these people are seeing on the screen. Uh, uh, they talk about Carrie, the bath scene, being like the psycho shower scene, and it's like, what? I mean, the psycho shower scene is completely unique. It's a whole series of very clever, quick cuts. Carrie gets into the bathtub, washes the blood off in about three, you know, uh, different cuts. There's absolutely no relationship except there's a girl in water. From what I've read about Hitchcock, he and Brian are very much alike in terms of their personalities, 
they both had a uh, sort of a dark sense of humor, shall we say, a penchant for the macabre. They're both quite witty, and uh, they both enjoyed uh, putting women in peril on film. <laughs> Happy birthday to Dominique and Danielle. Dominique and Danielle? You gotta be kidding. Dominique is here. C'est lui qui nous a séparés. C'est lui qui, qui m'a fichu dans cet hôpital. You want to know all our secrets? I will share them with you. Watch. It's so creepy. It's that score. Yeah. And those creepy twins and all those freaks running around. It's extremely creepy. You don't realize these things until you've done them. I mean, you go, whoa. I mean, it's, it's interesting because you think, did I think that up? Whoa. See, the interesting thing about making movies is once you do them, you don't think about them anymore, which yeah. is, that's the great thing about being an artist is you can get those strange images in your head out, you know, or you'd probably be a serial killer. <laughs>